بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد من تحت باب رحمة الله هذا ما سمعنا من الشراء والسلام دائما من الدعاء من شدة ولا آلي وصحبه هذا كله درس من ألف مرة بسم الله إن شاء الله we'll give the English talk first so we'll remain sitting for this portion when we get to the Arabic we'll do the standing khutbah this is the position of can't hear you this is the position that's well accepted in the in the school of Abu Hanifa radiyallahu an so we'll give the English talk first inshallah so we find ourselves today is the 10th day of Rabi'u Thani in 1439 Hijri um, I actually gave a similar khutbah on a similar topic about a similar person the same person actually in January of this year in MCC but it's always a good reminder and it's the barakah of having our lunar years um, coincide uh, well. You can have uh, the same month in the same solar year, which is actually quite interesting. But Rabi Thani is a blessed month, and there's some amazing things that happen in this month, in particular, uh, some important events that we should all be cognizant of. Number one, on the eighth day of Rabi Thani, this was the birth of Imam Hassan al Asqari. The tenth day was the passing of Bibi Fatima bin Musa Kadim who was the son of Imam Ali Rida. <coughs> comes from the line of Imam Hussein, and according to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they're all Sunnis, they're all from Ahlul Sunnah. On the 11th day, which is tomorrow, marks the Urs, or the Hawl, or you can say the passing, whatever you want a term you use, but it's the, the occasion of the passing of the great erudite scholar, the great Imam, my maternal grandfather, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jinani, he passed away in 561 Hijri, 940 years ago. The 15th day of this month was the passing of my own teacher, Habib Abu Bakr al Haddad, one of the direct descendants of Imam al Haddad. He's buried in Jannah al Ma'ala. The 27th day of this month was the passing of one of the greatest scholars in the history of our deen. Sheikh Ahmed Sirhindi, who is the grandfather, the great grandfather of our esteemed brother uh, Fridun Mujaddidi. And the entire line of the Naqshbandi Mujaddidis come directly from Mujaddid Al Fathani. He was the scholar that many people attributed to him that come once every thousand years. He was such a magnificent scholar. And the 29th day of this month marks the path passing of the beautiful title Shaykh al Akbar, Murhideen ibn Arabi. And there are some differences of opinion regarding some of his, some of his positions regarding Waqt al Wujud and some other things, which we don't necessarily need to get into. All we need to understand, in particular, that he was a great scholar of Islam. We need to understand that his influence and all these people had a tremendous influence on who we are and the reason we are where we are. So we're going to focus a little bit today on Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani in honor of him. He was a master of fiqh. He was raised in Iran at that time. He was, he was a master of the Quran al Karim. He was a master of usul, of tasawwuf of the Persian language and of the Arabic language. And his miracles were mutawatir. Mutawatir meaning that they were so well witnessed in his presence and in, the, in, in, the, in uh, just the community that it's impossible to deny it, that these things happen. We're not living in the time, or we're not talking about a time where something is caught on camera or something is literally discussed and it's just dismissed saying this is fake news. This is not what we're talking about here. This is witnessed by thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people <coughs> in one gathering. It's impossible to deny. His influence was so great 
that he was the imam and the teacher of many scholars, and in his influence spread beauty. The first people will mention that followed his inner path, that listened to what he had to say, that tried to purify their souls based upon his principles. The first one we'll mention is Ibn Taymiyyah, and all of his students, Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Rajab, Ibn Kathir, they all were qadri in tariqah. It's not, it's, not, it's not negotiable. This is history. You can't deny these things. Imam Sahar Warbi, whose book was the single favorite book on tasawwuf of Imam al Haddad, was one of his direct students. And we actually have people in our community with the last name Sahar Warbi that are descendants of him. Sultan Muhammad al Fatih, the one who the Prophet said about al Khandaq that he would be the person that would conquer Constantinople. Ni'mat al-Amir wa ni'mat al How blessed the commander. Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. <coughs> As a child, he was taken by his father and put into the lap of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jinan, who held his neck and held his body and made dua for him when he was a small boy. When he was ready to pass from this world, one of his students came to him and said, Are you not sad that you didn't die on the battlefield? His response was, When I was a child, my father took me and put me in the lap of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jinani. I will never die by the sword of a non-Muslim on the battlefield. Suleiman the Magnificent, whose portrait hangs inside the Congress building in Washington, D.C., Suleiman the Lawgiver, who instituted in his time as the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire over a thousand laws. Tipu Sultan and his father, Haider Ali, who spread Islam to the Maldives, one of the last kings of India. Both Abu Madian, Ibn Mashish, who also as a child was held and made dua for by Shaykh Abu Fadr Jinani. His students become people like Shaykh, <laughs> Shaykh Abu Hassan al Shadi. Shams al Tabriz, the teacher and the master of our Imam, Mawlana Rumi. Aziz Mahmoud al Hudai who was the Imam and the teacher of the Ottoman Sultans. His shoes to this day are kept inside of Topkapi Palace as part of the sacred relics. The awliya, the people of, of Istanbul used to visit him before they used to set out on their journeys in hopes that they would derive blessings and they would return safely. Khwaja Abdullah, who in 1674 passed away in China, they called him Shaykh al-Halal al-Din. He established one of the greatest cities in China of learning for Islam. And Shaykh Akbar, Muhyiddin ibn Ali, who, whose father went to Shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jinani and asked him for dua so that he could have a son. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jinani is mentioned in Imam Dhahabi's texts, Hadadik al al right? He's mentioned by, as one of the people who protected and preserved our deen. So, uh, generally speaking, in our communities, we talk a lot about miracles, which is wonderful and it's important. And many of us as children grew up learning about the miracles of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jinani. I did. That's how I was taught a lot of love, was really just about miraculous things. But as I got older, I realized that there is actually a way to achieve these miraculous things. And sometimes Allah gives it, and sometimes He doesn't. But we don't do anything ex for some sort of external reward. We don't follow our deen because it's an if you want sheet. We follow our deen and we do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to do because this is His haq. These are the words of Murab al Hajj. So, in, refer in reference and in re re reflection of Surah Al Naba, Allah says, Inna lil muttaqina mafaza. Indeed, for the people of taqwa is attainment. 
What does this mean? Who are the people of Taqwa? And what does attainment really mean? So on the fourth discourse of Futr al Ghaib, I actually remember, I was telling my wife and my children on the way here, I remember exactly when I was taught this, this discourse. I was 13 years old. I remember exactly what I was thinking. And I'll share this with you as I go through this. But he says, radiyallahu ta'ala an, that when you make yourself dead to your creation, there's different ways of doing it. A person can pass away from this world. Some of us went to the janazah earlier this week of our dear beloved aunt, Auntie Amina. We prayed over her. Some members of our community, her sons, who are on a spiritual path, put her into the ground and we made dua for her. We continue to make dua for her. Many of us have relatives that have passed away. Many of us have friends who have passed away. Our fathers, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, sometimes even our own children. But what he's reminding us here, he says, when you pass away, people say, Rahimullah. People say, Rahmatullah alayh. May the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon them. If we're lucky enough to be amongst the elite, he might even have the chance of saying, Radiullahu an. Surah Ammayyat Sa'amin. Right? And so in, 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 in Juz Amma. Right? We hear, Radiullahu an wa radu an. This is a description of the people who are content with Allah and Allah is content with them. So he says, you have to try to attain the station of being dead to the rest of creation while you're here. Make yourselves, he says, what does this mean? You don't walk around like trying to pretend that you're dead. Right? Don't make yourself smell bad. Don't dress in ragged clothing. He says, rather, kill your desires of your flesh. He says, and by doing so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you new life. He says, lower your limbs so that your soul may be elevated. Put things in their proper place. If you do this, and he tells us exactly what the outcome is going to be. He says, your soul will be given life that has no death. You, inshallah ta'ala, will be entering into Jannah for those. Inshallah, may we all be entering into Jannah for those with our Prophet You'll experience a wealth after which there is no poverty. Because once you attain knowledge, and after you attain something that other people can't have, there's no poverty. Poverty is, wealth is not necessarily defined as having a lot of money in your bank account. Some of the wealthiest people, the most magnificent, most most gracious people I've ever met are people that have the least in this world. You will receive gifts after which there are no obstructions. You will receive happiness after which you won't experience sorrow. You will experience blessings after which there will be no adversity. Knowledge after which there's no ignorance. Security after which there's no fear. Prosperity after which there's no ill fortune meaning no bad luck. You will experience honor <coughs> after which there is no dishonor because the honor comes from Allah. You will experience nearness so that you're never kept away. You will be exalted in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where you won't be lowered in the eyes of humanity. It won't be consequential to you. You will never be abused because it's all coming from Allah. You'll be purified so that you're never polluted. And when you hear flattering remarks from people, it's only what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do. One day Abu Hanifa was walking by and he heard some people talking about him. And a young person said, there goes Abu Hanifa. He stands up all night in prayer. Abu Hanifa at that point, in his, in his, it's recorded, that he didn't he used to do it sometimes, but not all the time. From that day forward until the day that he passed away, he never slept in the night. He prayed Fajr with the wudu of Isha for 40 years. After hearing a compliment from someone, a flattery from someone, it was advice that he understood. And he says more than anything here, you, if you go through this path, will be recognized by the knowers of God. 
the Arifin will start to recognize who you are. He says, and this is how you become the heir to the prophets. And this is how you become the heir to the Siddiqin. He says, and when you attain this position, through your prayers, all of your difficulties will be solved. You have difficulties, you have difficulties in your family, you have difficulties in your job, you have difficulties in anything in the world. <coughs> your strategic response is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to pray to raka'ah, is to raise your hands in supplication and make dua. He says that when you do this, the clouds will come bearing rain. May Allah make it rain. May Allah make it rain. He says, and your fields will turn green. May Allah make our mountains green. He says, and through these du'as, the calamities of people will be averted. Some have the station, he says, of the calamities be, being averted for your people in your immediate locality. Maybe just Dublin or San Ramon. Maybe just a specific district within Baghdad. He says, or some may have the maqam of their du'as protecting the Muslims in their entire country. Or some may have the maqam of their du'as being protect, protective for, against calamities for Muslims even to the furthest frontiers of the world. He said, and your prayers will become a protective force. So much so that people will travel from great distances in order to come and see you and visit you and obtain your dua and serve you and just seek your prayers. <coughs> but he says, but this only happens to those who give themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I remember when I went through this, my mom taught me all of these things. She went through these specific principles and I remember at age 13 I thought to myself, I hope to meet one of these people one day. I just simply hope to be able to meet one of these people one day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom has placed these specific people in different parts of the world. And sometimes you don't even have to go that far. But you'll meet some of these great people and great awliya and when you see them, identify them, recognize them and give them the appropriate respect that you're supposed to. Go and seek their prayers. He says, and the biggest way of attaining these things, of reaching these maqams, is by following ten principles. Ten principles. Same in Fatul Ghaib. Number one. Don't swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when you're speaking the truth, we have a tendency in our community of saying wallahi all the time. He says refrain from doing that. Even when speaking the truth, why? He said because you'll start treating it lightly. Your word is your bond. A man with no word has no honor. When you give your word to someone, you follow it through. It's a reputation. It's who you are. He says, don't swear by Allah. Number one. And especially don't do it when you're lying. Number two, he says, avoid lying in its entirety, whether intentionally or in jest. Number three, be careful with your promises. Have a fear deep in your heart of failing to keep your promises. When I read this, I actually took time to write down all the promises I've made to people. And I keep a kind of a tab, like a, it's just something that one of my teachers told me to do. It's like when you keep a record of your debts. This system actually has difference because you can get debt collectors and they will send you a mail, something in the mail or something along those lines. With promises, you don't have that. Promises what you make to your wife or your children or your or your companions. Make sure you understand that when a promise is made, it should be fulfilled. <coughs> he says, and don't curse anything in creation. I was 20 years old, Sheikh Hamza told me, he said, will be the worst thing a person can say is 
is, is the word damn and precede it with the word God or Allah. It's the, one of the worst things a person can ever say. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to curse someone. Don't do it. He says, number five, and don't invoke evil or want ill for anyone. Especially even the ones who have wronged you. Even the ones who wronged our Messenger وسلم, he made du'a for their guidance. When angels came and at Daif and were willing to crush an entire city. <coughs> no. He's rahmatul alamin. Number six, he said, and do not assert evidence or unbelief uh, of unbelief or hypocrisy. When you see something of a mistake of someone else, correct them quietly. Don't try to expose them. Our master Abu Hanifa radiyallahu said, I would rather assume a thousand. And when it says a thousand, it's a great number. A thousand non-Muslims were Muslim rather than assuming one Muslim was a non-Muslim. It is safer for you to assume that someone who's not in the boundaries of our deen, someone who's among, not amongst the, the Muslims, is actually within our boundaries. Number seven. Do not allow your mind to contemplate sin. When the thoughts come into your mind, remove them immediately. Say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-Ali al-Adhim. Recite Surah Al-Yaseen. Recite Fatiha. Put yourself in the presence of the Kaaba. Put yourself in the presence of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remove the thought of sin from your mind. And keep your limbs distant from those thoughts. Number eight, he says, do not burden any fellow creature. We are placed in the world, he says, to relieve burdens, not to increase burdens upon others. We're told, walk gently upon the earth. Number nine, don't covet others who have possession of the world. Put your trust in Allah, and you will be given vast domination. Number 10, he says, be humble. He said, and this is the hardest out of all of them. She comes a reminder us, Sidi Ahmed Zarouk says, that if a person claims something that's higher than, the, the, than, the, than they are, a higher station than what they've been given, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will afflict them with scandal. If a person claims something that is actually theirs, a station that is their own, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will abase them. But if a person claims something which is lower than he or she is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate them. He said, this is the hardest thing to do is to be humble. So the tree does not grow except that the seed is placed into the ground, beneath the earth. So he says, in order to be humble, you have to think to yourself when you meet someone else. Perhaps this person is better than I am in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe he's higher in degree. Maybe he's done some amazing action that only Allah knows about. Don't ever think yourself to be higher than anyone else. There was this riwayah in our tradition about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. One of the companions of Sayyidina Isa was walking with Sayyidina Isa along a path. And there was a robber, she comes and narrates this, he told us this when we were studying it. A robber walking the other way. Maybe not a robber, maybe I'm recalling the story incorrectly. But there was someone of ill repute walking the opposite direction. And this person thought to himself, how dare this person of ill repute is walking on the same road as a messenger of God and one of his friends. And as they got closer, this person started to feel more and more anger in his heart. Until the point where they met. And the person of ill repute, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so displeased with this person's arrogance, Allah put all the goodness that was with the companion with the person of ill repute, and the person of ill repute became the companion of Sayyidina Isa. Don't have this excessive thing in your heart, he said. If you meet someone younger than yourself, think to yourself, this person has not offended Allah, he's too young. His du'as are still accepted, he's like masoom. If a person is older than you and you meet them, think to yourself, this person has served Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala long before I ever did. 
If you meet someone who's learned, think to yourself, this person has received from something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have not. They've experienced something that I have not. They've acquired something that I have not. And, they, and he knows that which I am ignorant of. And he puts his, his knowledge into practice. If you meet someone who's ignorant, tell yourself, this person has offended the boundaries of Allah only because he's ignorant. While I do sins knowingly. The person who knows and the one who doesn't know, they're not the same. They're not the same in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That goes for sin as well. But the person who knows that they're crossing the boundaries of God, knowingly, this is something, this is advice for myself. He says, and I don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for me or for him. Maybe Allah will elevate him towards that in his life. And if you meet someone who's not a believer, say to yourself, maybe he's going to witness. Maybe he'll take his shahada. Maybe he'll embrace Islam. And maybe he's going to have a host of khatim. And maybe I won't. That's in the hearts of Allah. That's in the knowledge of Allah. He says, if you have this mindset, you will be close to the chosen ones of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will be protected from the whispering of shaitan. You will find yourselves at the gates of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your bone marrow will be healthy in your worship. Your bone marrow in your dua will be healthy. When your bone marrow is sick, your whole body becomes sick. He says, and this will become your mark in the unseen for the people of devotion and knowledge. Alhamdulillah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.